everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. Uh, SALT Talks are a series of digital interviews we've been doing during the work from home period in lieu of our global conference series, the SALT Conference, uh, to provide our audience a window into the mind of subject matter experts and provide a platform for what we think are big, world-changing ideas and tremendous investment opportunities as well. We're very excited today to welcome Doug Monticciolo to Salt Talks. Uh, Doug is the co-founder, the co-CEO, and the co-chief investment officer of Brevet Capital Management. He's an entrepreneur and an investment manager with deep data analytics and technology experience, developed over three decades while providing credit financing and advisory services. And I think if Doug didn't uh, found Brevet Capital and go into financial services, he might have been helping uh, Elon Musk with SpaceX. But we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, Doug founded Brevet Capital Management in 1998 and has established the firm as a leader in helping government agencies solve complex problems and drive positive social impact uh, by creating innovative financing products and services. And I know Brevet has been very busy during this time of, of really high government spending in response to the COVID pandemic, another uh, item that we'll touch on during today's talk. This finance as a service approach provides direct lending and other financing to private middle market companies that enables them to effectively serve government sector, the government sector as contractors. And it, it creates a very low credit risk strategy when you have the Department of Justice as your uh, enforcer of, of payments in this type of business model. And it has a highly competitive barriers to entry that Brevet has been able to crack. Doug's years of experience working in startup environments as a software entrepreneur and with an asset-backed securities, fixed income, and investment banking helped him identify a gap in the market where traditional lenders failed to provide the innovative financing and forward-looking advisory services needed for private contractors, uh, private government contractors to rely on and deliver services. Uh, Doug has a passion for technology and approaches investing in credit financing with a problem-solving mindset. He began his career at Goldman Sachs in the Financial Institutions Industry Resource Group, where he specialized in investment banking and principal finance trading. And he helped create numerous service, service mark products and services to address the unmet needs of clients. He later uh, spent time at Lehman Brothers and also Deutsche Bank, where he was the head of the proprietary fixed income group in the merchant banking and principal finance group. Uh, Doug's career took a turn from academics to finance when he was studying at Columbia University and working at Fisher Black, uh, which was the creator of the Black Skulls model on complex mathematical formulas. He was encouraged to apply his skills to financial problem solving instead of academia, and he decided to put aside his pursuit of a PhD to join Goldman Sachs. But Doug did receive a Master's of Engineering Sciences degree in Applied Mathematics from Columbia University, and he graduated from the State University of New York at Stony Brook with a uh, MS in Applied Mathematics and a BS in Applied Mathematics and Computer Science. Uh, Doug is a, also a Level 3 certified member of the National Association of Rocketry, uh, and a member of the Randonneurs USA, which is a long distance road biking organization. We we're talking before we went live about you know, how we're uh, riding our bikes to stay in shape during the COVID pandemic. Uh, so that's another interesting thing Doug is involved in. He also coaches robotics and innovation and has led teams to numerous regional awards in that field. He led one of, the, one of his teams to a worldwide second place finish in the FLL Global Innovation Awards season sponsored uh, by Edison Nation and, and the XPRIZE Foundation, which was in cooperation with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. He also currently serves on the board of directors of Hope for New York and is a board member of the Young Presidents Organization Gotham Chapter. Reminder, if you have any questions for Doug during today's talk, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And conducting today's interview is going to be Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm, as well as the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for today's interview. Hey, well, John, thank you, Doug. It is always an honor to be with you. And uh, we go back a long ways. And I got to ask you a question that I could only ask a fe fellow Italian. Have you been successful or were you ever successful at explaining what you do to your parents? <laughs> Good question. Uh, no. Uh, unfortunately, my dad was a butcher. My mom was an Avon lady. Um, I think they understand it's entrepreneurial business, uh, but finance probably wasn't the core. Yeah, so I'm still trying to figure that out, though. I cannot <laughs> explain to my parents what I do, but I just thought I would throw that in there 
uh, more than 20 years, uh, you've been at Brevet, uh, amazing success story. Why did you name it Brevet? That's one of my questions. And mm. then what was the idea for the business model? What, 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 where did the spark come from? Sure, so Brevet, and uh, everybody notes that it's not Brevet, uh, but it is Brevet because you heard John talk about randonneurs which is this very old uh, French long distance cycling uh, organization precedes the Tour de France. And in order to be a member of Brevet uh, or of Randonneurs, you need to take these um, qualifying tests. They're um, self-driven benchmarks that are challenges that you have to pass, very long distance rides without any support, and they're called Brevets. And so Brevet as a business, was exactly that. It's our challenge to self-achieve, to push ourselves further than uh, than you normally would. And you know, given that some of these rides are 1,200 kilometers, I think that's a good reflection of uh, Brevet. And our business, you know, we're an all credit fund. And everybody asks, well, what what does that mean? That means we're a credit fund. That means predominantly we are collateralized, not just generally, but very specifically, and we're senior secured in almost all cases. Um, and what drove me to do this was I had the opportunity, right, to be very young. I was at a startup right out of high school, did well in the software industry. And I got to go and learn these great skills. And I wanted to create a business that was, I felt at least, a little more responsible in investing than just providing financial products or out-of-the-box solutions. And I believe that by doing that, I could generate higher returns. And so we as a firm are very well known for not being super aggressive but more importantly, being very constructive. And so we take all these skills that I've learned over my career and my team, and we bring value-added solutions to create a better outcome. Right? So I was at Deutsche, and I basically had the, uh, the benefit of the Morgan Grenfell name, which is why JP Morgan created it, was we wanted to bring more than just the money to bear. And so our finance as a service, as you heard John say, really is our benchmark, right? We're not just bringing money, we're bringing a solution and our skills now we're government focused, and that's maybe a place where you need the most you know, help to be brought. Right? They're not very commercial, they're definitely not very efficient. And so you know, if I was to sort of be true to my responsible investing ethos, the government's a great place to do it. And the other flip side of it is the fact that if you help the government do things, you're helping citizens, not just in the US, we do this around the world, and the outcomes are great. So good returns, good outcomes, you know, it was almost a recipe I couldn't pass up, harder work, but the outcomes are worth it. So, so let, let's dive into that because I think it's important to give a specific example so that it totally crystallizes for people what your business exactly is. So if I need money from you, what am I typically doing? I, I have a contract with the government. The government's going to pay me, but I, I go to you to get some uh, uh, a lending facility in waiting for that payment. Is that more or less your business strategy? So... Our business, and that's the traditional credit approach, which is borrower goes to lender. Um, we actually turn the model around. Our clients are the government. And so we go to the government and say, what's not working? Obviously, we're a very trusted party in around 20 years to be able to do this. But they tell us we're having problems getting um, this program that we have all this money for to create jobs, say, in rural America, or uh, having problems inducing certain types of research and development. We're having problems with trying to get money out to the right businesses in a pandemic. And so we sit with them and say, well, here's our capabilities. We have a lot of resources, we have a lot of skills, we have a lot of relationships. Give us a feeling for where you want it to go. And we'll then work with them to say, you just make sure that as this plays out, we're gonna do the following. You, the government, pay us back. We'll go and make sure that the money gets to where it needs to go. And so if you're a borrower and we knock on your door, it likely means you're going to get something that you didn't think that you could get, which is typically free or low-cost government opportunity that you didn't really think was going to come your way or you couldn't figure out exactly how to get it. And so we do that finance as a service. Yeah, it's finance, but the services are both the government and to the company, and we get paid for that. And that's basically how, how we do what we do. So how, how has the business changed, Doug, during the COVID-19 environment Seems like there's a proliferation of governmental financing out there and funding. Has that helped you guys or hurt you guys or indifferent? Well, I think uh, it's a good question, right? Because 
COVID a pandemic is not something we could have predicted. Um, we we don't chase crises, but you know, in this case, it's a clear demonstration of why the model works, which is in what other industry in this economic environment is somebody trying to put out two trillion dollars, and where are major other sovereigns trying to do the same thing, right? So. Um, where we focus on this and what the opportunity for us is, we were called in March right as the pandemic was breaking because they were calling in trusted parties, how try to help solve problems. So, you know, in short, yes, it's been tremendously helpful to our business, not just in the big volume increase, which we see every time there's a new program, but more in the, the trusting of the relationship and the reiterating, regardless of the administration now, it's sort of proving out that they call us when they need help. And we're there with our money and our ideas. And for just our ideas, it's free. But most of the times we're bringing that solution. So um, been quite a bit. And we haven't slept much in the last uh, couple of months. But uh, it's been there trying to hopefully bridge some of the gaps, which is a lot of what we do. You're, you're, I just want to get a little more definition here because sure. uh, I, I'm getting a couple of text messages that let Doug elaborate on an <laughs> example of, of capital. So... Government comes to you and says, we're trying to push this out. Yep. You go to somebody and say, okay, listen, I can lend you money. You'll get the money from the government. And a result of which you're getting a return off of that uh, connection. Is that fair to say? Or it's, wanna... it's similar to that. So let's take one of the programs, Economic Development Program, where particularly now they're trying to, uh, governments are trying to get capital out to companies doing research and development in various areas that can potentially be additive to solving the COVID crisis, detection, early warning, other types of things. And so governments are good, but they really don't know how to find those companies. And it, believe it or not, most of the times they give that money through the IRS or through Treasury, which is not necessarily, necessarily a very friendly place. So what we do is we understand and work with the government to make sure we know exactly what they want. And then we turn around and say, okay, we'll go and find those companies for you. We'll actually help them apply. We'll work through the entire process. And we'll go give them the money in two days, knowing that we've already conferred with the government that the process we're going to pursue is going to get the repayment or the government to pay for that. And in these cases, they actually pay us. So we'll help a company be able to get the government money. In this case, in one case, actually, is helping a um, R&D on a product that can help early detection for COVID. And... They need the capital, we're afraid to apply. We simplified it, made it easy for them, gave them the money backed by the fact that we knew the government was gonna pay us. So we turned the transaction around, we lend the borrowers and get repaid by governments, not your traditional model, but great credit risk and great opportunity. Okay, I think it's an excellent description of what you're doing and, and, it, and it fits so nicely into the world of alternatives because it's a, it's a yep. niche that can't be replicated in an ETF, it can't be, bought on an exchange, it can't be, uh, it's got to be esoterically designed by you guys and sourced. Uh, and that's where all the value that Purvey is adding uh, to the clients. Uh, if, you, if you step back over the 22 years at Brevet and your interaction with the government, and I'm going to editorialize you a little bit, Doug, the government has a bad rap, I'm just being totally candid. Yep. Uh, a lot of people are not in love with the government, the cumbersomeness of it, the bureaucracy, what do you say about the government? Do you still have faith in it, uh, especially given in this period of turbulence that we're all experiencing? Well, it's a good question, H having faith. I think, uh, I think we all know the answer to that, right? Everybody knows there's two things of certainty, death and taxes. So if you believe that that's true, then you just basically bought the business model of the federal government, which is you live there, you bought their product, you pay your taxes. The, the hard part and where the frustration comes from is two things, what your expectations are. If your expectation is, I'm gonna go build a bridge building company, and I'm gonna hope that the government gives me contracts, then you're gonna potentially wind up in disappointment because government priorities may change. But if you're in a business like ours, where you listen to where the government would like you to go, and you basically sit on their side of the table, you don't get that disappointment. Matter of fact, the biggest challenge we always face is, we're disappointing them because their ass sometimes is so great solve problems that we're not exactly sure we can solve. But a lot of times, like those R&D companies, you really think the government, some part of the government, commerce or somebody, in any country, by the way, can go out and find incubating companies, backed by big companies or not, and figure out how to convince them that they should go take this government money 
and that they should accelerate their research, right? So I saw a lot of faith in the government. Obviously, there's going to be challenges. We don't really go down to the municipal or state level. We'll do some things at state, normally backed by the federal government, like the CARES Act um, is putting in a tremendous amount of money, very specific. So we always look to something simple here, which is we're looking at how we're going to get repaid, right? So we're going to the government and saying, if you're good for this, then let's confirm that, and I'll go get it for you. You just got to repay me, right? So, you know, I have, I have faith in it. I expect volatility. I do expect a bunch of challenges. Um, but, you know, I think right now, if anything, there's still taxes, maybe a little bit distorted, but prioritization's changed. And I think that's the advantage, is it's much clearer as to where the government wants to put its money. And so there's $2 trillion sitting out there as an opportunity, and there's going to be more. Being in front of that and helping them do it is a great opportunity. Well, the, the other thing, when you hear the word government in the context of your business, there's an implied level of safety there. So let's talk to per prospective investors of Purvey Capital. What are the risks of investing in Purvey Capital? What are the opportunities? Have you balanced that over the 22 years? Sure. So, so there's always risk investing, even if it's government, even if we were great, there's always, you know, things that happen and we're, we're not immune to them in general. Um, in investing, there's structure, product structure, risks. We have an open end fund with liquidity. We have a closed end fund um, that's permanent and, and closed. Um, you know, th there's always those structure risks. But when you think about where the challenges come from in government, it's as if you do just one thing. One of the things that Brevet has achieved, and this took a long time and a lot of money, was to be not focused on one thing. So we're in five different countries. Why are we in five countries? People say, man, it spread yourself too thin. The flip side of that is, I know that if someone changes their mind in some agency in the federal government in the US, that same person doesn't change their mind in Canada or in Ottawa. Right? It's a completely different, unrelated basis. It gives me diversity, it gives me protection. Is it perfect? No, there's things that can change. You're always working with governments. You have to stay light on your feet. But our business is based on providing solutions, right? So finance as a service means service is the way we get our returns and service is the way we get our opportunities. So as long as I build a suite of services, I can apply them to the opportunity de jure, you might say. But in reality, I'm applying them consistently across areas, you know, education, infrastructure, healthcare, rural communities, and rural community development. You know, a lot of what we do is just jobs and job retention um, is a very big part of the programs that we're involved in, simply because there's so many of them in the federal government, largest part of the GDP. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons of the federal government, but I think you'd always find the, the pro as long as you're willing to look for it. Well, you, you're, 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 your shop is a little smaller relative to say an Apollo or Carlisle and your the business depends on accessing a lot of this expertise and knowledge. So tell us about your methodology and how do you uh, uh, provide such a deep bench given your size and nimbleness? Yeah, that's a good question um, because we're just under hundred people, five countries. How do we staff that and how do we manage it? And more importantly, how do we actually provide the solution, the service? when it's got to take a ton of people to just be operationally in all these countries. And the answer is, we started this way back in, in the beginning of the firm, 20 plus years ago, where we started venturing uh, and partnering with universities. And we started working with research organizations. We work with AI and big data institutions, firms, not-for-profits. And the reason we do that is because we need to not just be on the leading edge, but we need to be aware of what the tools are to solve problems and to be better at getting some of this done. So while we may be just 100 people, I can pretty much assure you we're the only credit group that actually has an R&D shop, our own research and development team, that's purely creating and innovating and always introspecting on our own transactions to make sure they're better. And that's part of the way that we actually provide. We've had a 9% net uh, long-term return on our fund and we're on levered through all these cycles. And a lot of that is the fact that we're constantly trying to stay ahead of what's going on and what's, what's aware, or what is available to governments because we're getting paid for bringing a value proposition, right? This is all based, this is like, this is like me being a child on a Long Island where you know, I was told we need, to, you know, we need to make some extra money so we could have better family vacations. So, you know, yeah, I, ran, I had a paper out. I would cut 
um, wood with a bow saw and an ax. My brother and I would start these businesses and be very entrepreneurial. We pour chocolates and sell them at church on, on Sundays. And the reason we did that is entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills is about value proposition. And so with an abundance of capital, the thing you have to do is differentiate yourself by something more than just money and maybe a few relationships. So we leverage our team by world-renowned parties. I was on the phone this morning with the CEO of one of the leading AI firms. And the reason being is we're using it to solve a problem for a sovereign. And so that's a lot of how we do it. Uh, long developed and actually, as you can tell, I have a lot of energy excitement about this because you know we're, we're solving problems that people haven't solved before. It's quite exciting. Doug, you talked, I talked a little bit in the open about how Brevet uses a lot of data. And I suspect that one of the answers to that question of how you replicate the expertise of these massive shops like a Carlisle with a smaller bench is that you do a lot of data analytics. And you talked about how you, you work with AI companies to solve problems with sovereigns, but you also do a lot of data analytics internally. Talk about that process and how your background it helps Breve uh, use data analytics in a way that maybe some other alternative investment shops don't. Sure. So, so we do use data quite a bit. We use it in interesting ways, right? We use it to make sure that the basic premises of the solutions that we're providing uh, make sense. And so, what does that mean? Uh, you know, in order to get that transaction I mentioned, which is the government's going to make a payment for some research and, and development, they want to give them a grant, but um, the company is too, too challenged to try to figure out how to fill out this massive document that the government has asked them to fill out. It's like your taxes squared. Well, the answers are pretty easy. What did H&R Block do? H&R Block partnered with IBM's Watson, right? AI big data system. <clears throat> so we essentially do the same thing. We use the data of our own um, information along with industry information and put it into systems that help make that process of how do you fill that form out better? And we do it in a way where it's not just easier for the borrower, but we also now can report back to the government and say, hey, by the way, we're going to give you a perspective on this industry that's broader. It's our perspective of experience, but it's also all this research brought into a common platform. And we're going to be able to show you where we're looking, how we're doing it, and how the money you just put out relates to that. And that does two things. One is it gets them a lot of comfort that they can trust us and they know where it's going. But two is they, start, they turn to us at times and say, what else should we be doing? Or how else should we be doing it? So the big data, which by the way, the, these systems on AI, if you got your head around the numbers, like we're working with a system which has read um, and translated every patent filed around the world. Right? Just as one of the data sets. Why is that important? Because it really helps with, is that truly R&D or not? Hey, those things are important for a government to know. And so with our access to things like that, it helps us fulfill our value proposition. On the one hand, we got a client, which is the government, which we have to be absolute integrity with. On the other hand, we got a company who's counting on us to bring that money to them. And our investors obviously are, are benefiting from this whole process of the fact that we're putting out that money and knowing that we're getting repaid by the government. And so it's all intertwined. My background, you know, getting my PhD in uh, at Columbia in applied math and obviously my, my systems backgrounds in databases and technology really helps quite a bit uh, and be able to see this. But my team is also extremely savvy in these areas. So one of the first things I asked you when, when we first spoke about your investment strategy is I said, this sounds really attractive. It's almost completely uncorrelated. You almost have no losing trades in terms of the transactions that you make. Maybe you can touch on that as well in this answer. But I said, why, why aren't more people doing this? And, and you explain why there's a lot of barriers to entry into what you do. Could you talk about that a little bit and why what you at, do at Brevet is so unique? Sure. So uh, first, I always give credit to Goldman Sachs on this, which, you know, coming right out of being a tech, you know, math person, I thought that 22 cash on cash percent return annually was the natural benchmark. So I've always had that as the mantra <laughs> of, if I'm not doing 22, then I must not be doing well. So kudos to them uh, and for showing me how to do it, right? And I think that that is a, a big part of the value proposition. But what we are doing is we do approach investing not as a bunch of trades that we give investors to pick and choose from, but a strategy that is holistic. So like I said, I'm diversifying within a portfolio. I could easily just take one of these transactions with Canada per se and offer a fund just for that. 
But my personal belief is if I'm truly going to be a responsible manager, I think that's irresponsible to do that for an investor because I'm not giving them the ability to have a more diversified trade. I could show them that same trade across several sovereigns and I could give them that same opportunity in a more risk-reduced fashion. What do I give up? I give up the, the ability to deliver a 40% cash and cash return. Right? Some of my stuff on leverage has always been up in those ranges. Well, by diversifying, I'm spending a lot more time and money in developing each of these opportunities simultaneously. And if anybody wonders, like, what does it take? It costs a lot more money for the very first assets that we do in any one of these spaces. We don't really rush into anything. So you got to be willing to invest in your business. And keep in mind, I didn't do this because I came from a trading desk and said, I'm going to take my strategy and move it into a fund and just repeat it. I came from a business building perspective. So Brevet is a long-term win for sure because it's invested the money, the time, the resources into people, into infrastructure, our technology costs are substantially higher than anybody else in the industry. And that's because they're built to do tens of billions, not a couple hundred million. They're built to be global. They're built to have things like AI interfaces. And a lot of this in credit is if you don't put it in up front and you don't make sure that you actually test it to make sure you did it right, then all you're doing is taking the risk that you were wrong. And my view is I'm a money manager and I got to keep the money in order to manage it, right? Our investors are, you know, public pensions, they're firemen, they're teachers, they're state employees. I think we take that responsibility very seriously. And I believe this is the right strategy to do. So it's a big barrier to entry in terms of relationships, investment, and patience. Anthony asked you earlier about whether you still have faith in government. And I want to ask you a little bit uh, different question as it relates to government. Obviously, Brevet provides a very important resource for the government. You help the government operate more efficiently. How do we you know, construct more public-private partnerships that help us mm. do more of that without you know, growing the size of government in a, in a tremendous way? How do we leverage the wherewithal and the efficiency of the private sector to help drive more efficient government and you know, make improvements in society as a result? It's, it's a good question. Uh, the, uh, the challenge is actually it has to come from the manager and it has to come from the manager's perspective, right? Um, I have one advantage that I did extremely well right out of high school, right? So my drive and motivation is not to put the biggest bank account, which is obviously a great thing to do because you can do great things with that, but it's to do the best things and actually have the best outcomes. And sometimes that means that the manager will make less, right? And that means that you have to be willing to sit down with a governor or the head of an agency, and this is what we do do, is show them everything. Um, we uh, have opened up that we will actually have all the way down to my personal financial statements and tax returns to show that um, we can form a partnership where there's an integrity and an honesty. And I think that's important because, uh, and by the way, I think it's coming because of the challenges in the market, is that everybody's got to reprioritize. Right? They're, they're, you know, infrastructure needs to be fixed. Pension funds need to be resolved and get better returns. And so there's this balance that needs to be done that I think a challenge like the pandemic may actually bring people back to slightly different priorities of realizing that maybe their missions in life may change a little. We don't mind investing our, our, our money in where we, what we believe and maybe deferring some benefits or profits down, to, down the road if we're going to do the right thing. And out, out of my business, one of the things we have to do is a large part of our business is pro bono because we can't be sure whether or not when we're working with the government if something we're going to do is going to involve our capital. And so we have to be willing to do that. That makes running the business a little more sophisticated. But I think in the end, public-private partnerships need to have the same basis where we've got to get people sitting on the same side of the table together. Right? Another thing I learned on the street, right, which was the most successful business opportunities are the ones where you sit on the same side as your client and help them solve their problems. Right. And I think everybody's sort of moving in that direction. Hopefully we could be a little bit of an example of that. I think there is a bit of now pressure on everything, right? Particularly economics, that maybe forces people to have to maybe compromise a little and you know sit on the same side of the table together. Doug, can you talk a little bit about your macro view uh, in the context of your business, mm. but also your general life experience as a fixed income investor? Uh, and the psychology tied to money. And so, so we, 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 we sit here today 
and I'll, I'll make this stipulation, the world is probably not configured the way we thought it was going to be 25 years ago. And so tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about your insight there and tell us what you say to investors. Sure, well, the first thing I always say is I'm a mathematician, not an economist. Um, so, uh, so sometimes we get in trouble for uh, being predictive based on what we see. I remember I was also trained by Fisher Black, which is, you know, can't forget the basics of options, which is the past is a very bad predictor of the future. But I am a big believer in behavior and sort of rational outcomes. And when I look forward and I look in this market, I see a couple of things. I see uh, it's going to put a lot more pressure on economics. Economics at the basic level, of where do you spend your money? Where do companies spend their money? Um, it will ferret out weak business models from strong business models. It'll create stronger business models or new models. So I'm very optimistic long-term from that perspective because I am a big believer, because uh, I did study chaos theory, that you do need a, a reset every now and then um, to sort of strip thing down, things down and rebuild them. So like a forest fire, sometimes that's necessary to build it back stronger. Um, so I think that is necessary. Um, I think we're in interesting times. You know, the, the world and the world economies are at challenges with each other. Um, there are challenges with the pandemic, and now they're challenged on top of that with trade and other issues. Um, from my view, uh, what I see is that as long as the next six months plays out and there's a vaccine and maybe it takes 12 months, and we come to some point this time next year, everybody figures out how to get back to work and figures out what those Zoom models are. I'm actually pretty optimistic two, three years out because it is going to um, rechange priorities. I think governments will change priorities, and that they are. Right? They're cutting some programs that maybe were a little fluff and focusing on we need better hospitals, we need better roads. Um, and maybe they're also changing some of their perspectives on what investing means and where they're putting their money and maybe not concentrating it so much and just following the overall trend, but maybe putting money behind things that actually help them move their goals forward. And we're actually hearing that and seeing that from sovereigns and say pensions, et cetera. So I'm very optimistic in the short term, fortunately, very pessimistic because I don't think we're done. Hopefully this is a relatively uh, quick path out uh, just a vaccine, and we get through that, I think we're going to come out as a global economy, stronger or better. You worry about deficits, Doug? Yeah, you have to be, right? I mean, if you look at states where you got pretty big holds in pensions, um, we already have pretty big um, needs in infrastructure. Uh, there's clear that monies can be spent in better ways uh, in, in just running some activities. And so, yeah, I mean, deficits are a problem. Um, the, the, there's two solutions. One is you gotta get it, you gotta get more efficient with whatever you have. And you have to figure out um, what can you do to sort of offset that long-term negative effect of a, of a you know, maybe an out of control spending situation. You know, it's, right now it's always hard to say whether or not, you know, spending two, two or $3 trillion on a pandemic is a good thing or a bad thing, um, but, it's what you do afterwards. You know, we have a mantra at, at Brevet, which is we never follow the rescue. We only follow the recovery, which is the rescue is always where the uncertainty, right? It's a human behavior response of doing what you got to do to solve a problem. But we, where we believe that the most important effort needs to be made is in the recovery of what do you do next? So we're doing that with the government now. It's kind of exciting that they actually did call us and we're pretty heavily involved. Because um, I do think the long-term recovery is what we should all be focusing on, cutting those deficits um, and getting ourselves back in a strong place. But like, I think if we let a little bit of the knife fall where it's going to fall, um, it might actually bring us back stronger like it did instead of the mid to late 90s. Doug, we have a few audience questions that I want to get into in our last sort of eight to 10 minutes of the talk. Uh, how do you deal with sort of counterparty risk and the risk of government deciding not to pay you back. I know it's, it seems like a low risk thing, but we have a couple <laughs> audience members who are curious about how you grapple with that. Sure, so, so in our history, there's, there's, there are two types of transactions you have to worry about with the government. Those types of transactions where it's purely discretionary um, and those types of transaction where it is um, purely good or service provided for a need. And as you mentioned, DOJ, so you can check there are press releases about Brevet partnering with the Department of Justice. That, that's true, we do do it. Um, and even the Federal Attorney General's Office knows of our activities and um, we are 
uh, very clear that we have to be very careful about the law. And so there are places where the government is not going to pay back, is going to fight. We've had lawsuits to clarify things, et cetera. Um, but the cases where the government's just not going to pay you at will, they have to realize that in the places where that happens, it's something that wasn't a critical need. It's probably something that maybe the manager or the money behind it was maybe getting outsized returns. I will say we've never had it happen. We've had a situation where they disputed the, the payments to one of our counterparties. That type of transaction we actually don't do anymore, but we'll win that as well. Um, as a matter of fact, it'll come out a win for the state and for us. Because one of the things about Purvey that's interesting is we try to be constructive, not aggressive or destructive. And so when those cases occur, we turn to remind them that, you know, whether we help them buy um, some, you know, inner city clinic to help serve some homeless people, we provide the money for that. 100% within their pre-approval and their guidance, we remind them that we're not here just to do that one. We're here to do the other 50. We've been larger than some states, entire programs in the state providing these type of services. And normally what happens is if you truly are bringing a value proposition, our experience shows us it doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that you don't have paths that you didn't expect to follow, but it doesn't mean that you're actually wind up a situation where they ultimately don't pay you. It is just a communication uh, process that you have to do or it's expensive. Yeah, but it goes back to barriers to entry. You know, the yep. answer to my question about barriers to entry is building that trust and relationship with uh, all your counterparties in government uh, right. to be able to do these transactions in a repeatable way. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we do is remember, we start with the government, right? We don't start by saying, we see this program, then we go find a company that's doing it because by then you're almost always an adversary of the government. We start by working with the government. And some people say, well, that may be crazy because that could take three to five years. And we can say, absolutely. We've been involved in changing some laws, helping refine some programs, giving some language for things they were planning to do. Um, and that's important because we're only doing if our true intentions are to make the government's program better. And we have to be willing to sort of open the kimono, you might say, and prove that you are. And sometimes I got to take private capital's management company's money and prove to them that we actually are doing something that's in their best interest. And when you do that, regardless of administration changes or not, you become the guys that get the phone call in March that says, we need some help, right? And we're going to need you to step up and we got each other's backs. And that's kind of how the conversation goes. Um, but in that case, it was a matter of life or death. It was also a matter of necessity. And so you have to be in the right place, right time. One thing Brevet does not do is ever be a contractor or a counterparty signer to the government. Because if that ever has a dispute, we would never want to be seen as the adversary. So we're always on their side of the table. And that's by design. And that is a conscious decision, which is almost the opposite of what most managed funds do. Right. They're always almost on the receiving side. So that's a good segue to the next uh, question from our audience is, do you have concerns about the current political climate, you know, partially as it relates to how you run your business? I know we, we've had conversations in the past where I asked you about you know, do you have concerns if someone like an Elizabeth Warren, who's viewed as an adversarial type of person to Wall Street, became the Secretary of the Treasury? Would, would that uh, impact your ability to do business? I think, you know, I know the answer to that question, but you know, the, the question from the audience is, do you worry about the political climate and sort of some of the demonization of Wall Street that exists out there? You have to be, I mean, the answer is yes. You have to be aware of the, the market that you operate in, right? And if you're in the tech space and suddenly everybody says they don't act like Apple, you're going to have problems, right? Um, one of the nice things is we're in five countries. Um, we easily can do as much volume in these other countries as we can here. Um, we're in there, we're established, we're domiciled in those places. So we're not just uh, being a, a passport player on it. So um, they are real, they're real businesses. And I do that just because I can't predict the future. Um, it's also very hard for new administrations. You'll see Brevet does very low business very little business in the first six months of a new administration because there's this trust transfer that takes quite a while. And so there always has to be that time period for them to understand who can be trusted and who can't. And you have to respect the fact that they have to be nervous. Uh, they have to be concerned as to uh, who they're working with because it is a pretty tumultuous environment in politics, particularly in the United States these days. So you can't blame them, whether it be a governor or it be you know, someone in Washington, right? So that always happens. Um, our view is you just got to be aware. You got to keep your eyes open. And I think the, 
the one thing that we always do is we put our best foot forward um, and we will take the step. I will put my firm um, at a bit of risk to say, look, you know, I wouldn't do this if it wasn't for trust, right? And we will take that step. And that's what you have to do, right? And uh, like people say, you know, why aren't they in the space? You know, I'm not sure every manager really wants to go and do that. I think some do, but do they really do it? Um, it's, a, it's a hard step because it means that you'll make less, right? Or you may make less, right? Or you're going to put yourself out there. Um, but I believe it's the right thing to do. Uh, I got all these great skills. I got this great team. We've got great opportunities. Um, we believe this is where they should be used. And I think that penetrates. You know, we just realize that it's not quite instantaneous. We've been doing this 20 years, right? No matter what it is, um, I can't expect a new governor or head of an agency or even um, elected official to turn around and say, hey, we love you just because someone else did, right? And right. that's part of the business. So I got one more question. It's for both yep. Anthony and Doug. And we have a question from our audience about there's a young man named Bob Castrignano, AKA the coach who uh, is mentored thousands of young men and women who have come through the Goldman Sachs training program. He also post nine 11 helped revive Sandler O'Neill. I uh, was, re was recently merged with uh, Piper Jaffrey and, and a great success story post nine 11. But uh, what has the coach meant to you? We'll start with you, Doug, and then to Anthony. The fact that he mentored you both and, and the differences in your personality is sort of astounding to me. But I'll start with you, Doug. What has what the coach meant to you as a mentor? I think the coach is, coach is a living example of what we try to be, right? You know, like when 9-11 happened, um, I was a fig person, San O'Neill's in banking. Um, I thought about, should I stop what we're doing? and walk in, we're doing, we're starting this business. Um, should I walk in and help out Sandler? I knew them well, I respected them tremendously, but should I drop everything and take a seat on that desk? And I hesitated and I sort of put my priorities first. Coach didn't, and coach stepped up um, and went there and basically said, I'm here to help. You know, that's, that's a role model I think all of us should look to follow, which is should do the right thing. Um, plus he's had, uh, I think he's seen the Pope, uh, or met with the Pope several times. I can't even get one, one meeting. So I think he's got me there <laughs> as well. Um, but no, look, he, 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 uh, you know, he follows a lot of what we like to follow at Purvey, which is our motto is we do what we say we do. Right. And, you know, being true and having integrity, it's the backbone of our business. Right. And it's why we're able to do what we do. And so I think coach has given us lots of support and guidance and confirmation that you got to do the right thing. Because uh, in the end, I do think you win. Well, first of all, Doug, Darcy was putting out a little bit of fake news, as you know, because Cash Rignano is old enough to be your grandfather and my <laughs> great grandfather. Okay, so I just want to make sure everybody knows that he's not a young guy. We're talking about an ancient fossil, okay, who uh, you're laughing because you know it's true. No, but in all, in all seriousness, I never admit it. <laughs> In all, in all seriousness, it's about Bob because there's now that we're bringing him up. I feel like Bob is the Kevin Bacon of all Goldman mm. Sachs entrepreneurs. We are all yeah. one, two, three, four, in some cases, six degrees separated from Bob. And Bob is also the decoder ring. So to me, if someone's friends with Bob or knows Bob, it's like definitionally they're a good guy, whether it's you or Hinsey or Dr. Fear, I could think of hundreds of people I've met along the way uh, through Bobby, uh, who I know happens to be a terrific guy, but he's a terrible dresser. I mean, let's just get it all out on the table while we're, we're here, okay? He's an absolutely terrible dresser, okay? He does not have a face for radio or television, but he has a face for Morse code, okay? That's how bad it is. <laughs> and the last thing is, I know he's tried to buy your hair piece from you. Do not sell him your hair piece because I think my hairpiece is more valuable than your hairpiece and I'm looking for him to buy mine. Okay, so I just want to leave it there. Okay. But we all love Cash Rignano and he is one of the real saints in our business. He's a uh, true legend in many different ways. Yep. I completely agree with you on that. All right. Well, we'll leave it there with some great words see on that, the coach. See that Dorsey, uh, I was picking on Bobby Cass. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to throw a few shots at you and the, I know that's George why I did it. That's the why George it. Washington portrait and the, <laughs> Full books and all this other stuff. Yeah, hey, I like Bob hey, Doug, because he's nice. Doug, to me. if your mother or your nana saw this setup from Darcy, I mean, please pass that barf <laughs> bag. Okay, she'd hit him with a wooden spoon, Dougie. That's right. Go ahead, go ahead, Darcy. 
All right. Well, I, I want to let everybody go and thank you, Doug, for joining us. Uh, you have a fascinating investment strategy uh, and, and the, the constructive way that, that you work with the government. You know, I think people don't maybe never heard of Brevet Capital or, or haven't heard of you, mm -hmm. but uh, you provide tremendous value to, to the U.S. Uh, government, U.S. society, and then the American people in general with what you do. So thank you for that.